Hello there, welcome back to this channel, where you can learn and watch videos about criminology. If you are new to this channel don't forget to subscribe to help it grow and reach more learners whose interest is to learn about criminology. In today's video we will deal with the early theories that explains why crime exists. The sequence of the presentation will be, first early 20th century theories second middle 20th century third late 20th century. The Contemporary Pioneers Fourth Other Theories Early 20th Century Theories 1. David Emile Durkheim, French, 1858-1917 He advocated the anime theory, the theory that focused on the sociological point of the positivist school, which explains that the absence of norms in a society provides a setting conducive to crimes and other antisocial acts, according to him. The explanation of human conduct lies not in the individual but in the group and the social organization. 2. Sigmund Freud, 1856-1969 Psychologists have considered a variety of possibilities to account for individual differences, defective conscience, emotional immaturity, inadequate childhood socialization, maternal deprivation, and poor moral development. The Freudian view on criminal behavior was based on the use of psychology in explaining an approach in understanding criminal behavior, the foundation of the psychoanalytical theory. His study emphasized the recognition of childhood events that could influence the mental functioning of adults. His examination of the genetic and then the developmental aspects gave the psychoanalytic theory its characteristics. In this video the works of Freud will be presented using the following sequence. First, level of consciousness second, human personality third, defense mechanisms fourth, psychosexual stages of development. Perhaps the most impactful idea put forth by Freud was his model of the human mind. His model divides the mind into three layers, or regions conscious. This is where our current thoughts, feelings, and focus live. Preconscious, sometimes called the subconscious, this is the home of everything we can recall or retrieve from our memory. Unconscious, at the deepest level of our minds resides a repository of the processes that drive our behavior, including primitive and instinctual desires. McLeod, 2013. Later, Freud posited a more structured model of the mind one that can coexist with his original ideas about consciousness and unconsciousness. Sigmund Freud maintained that the personality consists of three different elements, the id, the ego and the superego. The id is the aspect of personality that is driven by internal and basic drives and needs. These are typically instinctual, such as hunger, thirst, and the drive for sex, or libido. The id is also the unconscious and stems from our instinctive abilities. The id acts in accordance with the pleasure principle, in that it avoids pain and seeks pleasure. Due to the instinctual quality of the id, it is impulsive and often unaware of the implications of actions. The ego is driven by the reality principle. The ego works to balance the id and superego, by trying to achieve the id's drive in the most realistic ways. It seeks to rationalize the id's instinct and please the drives that benefit the individual in the long term. It helps separate what is real, and realistic of our drives as well as being realistic about the standards that the superego sets for the individual. Additionally, the ego is how we view ourselves. This is conscious, but not always true. For example, someone could believe they are the best looking person in the world. However this is just an opinion they have and not everyone will agree with that belief. The superego is driven by the morality principle. It acts in connection with the morality of higher thought and action. Instead of instinctively acting like the id, the superego works to act in socially acceptable ways. It employs morality, judging our sense of wrong and right and using guilt to encourage socially acceptable behavior. Furthermore, the superego comes from the people around us. They affect what we believe in and how we view things. So this can be different depending on how you were raised and the culture you were around. The superego is also responsible for finding the happy medium between the id and ego. 
The id can sometimes be overly dominant when there are humanistic urges. The ego can be very unrealistic in terms of how we view ourselves. Defense mechanisms Defense mechanisms, we all have them. A defense mechanism is exactly what it sounds like, a mental or emotional defense used to protect us from stress and pain. Freud believed these three parts of the mind are in constant conflict because each part has a different primary goal. Sometimes, when the conflict is too much for a person to handle, his or her ego may engage in one or many defense mechanisms to protect the individual. These defense mechanisms include repression. The ego pushes disturbing or threatening thoughts out of one's consciousness. Denial. The ego blocks upsetting or overwhelming experiences from awareness causing the individual to refuse to acknowledge or believe what is happening. Projection The ego attempts to solve discomfort by attributing the individual's unacceptable thoughts, feelings, and motives to another person. Displacement The individual satisfies an impulse by acting on a substitute object or person in a socially unacceptable way, for example, releasing frustration directed toward your boss on your spouse instead. Regression as a defense mechanism, the individual moves backward in development in order to cope with stress, for example, an overwhelmed adult acting like a child. Sublimation, similar to displacement, this defense mechanism involves satisfying an impulse by acting on a substitute but in a socially acceptable way, for example, channeling energy into work or a constructive hobby, McLeod, 2013. Rationalization Most of us rationalize to some extent, but the more sensitive the ego, the more unconsciously this happens. Reaction Formation This occurs when your natural reaction to something is unwanted or unacceptable. Instead, the mind forms a reaction that's very much the opposite of the natural reaction. The five psychosexual stages of development Finally, one of the most enduring concepts associated with Freud is his psychosexual stages. Freud proposed that children develop in five distinct stages, each focused on a different source of pleasure. First stage, oral birth to one year the child seeks pleasure from the mouth, for example, sucking, initial psychosexual stage during which the developing infant's main concerns are with oral gratification. The oral phase in the normal infant has a direct bearing on the infant's activities during the first 18 months of life. Second stage. Anal 1 to 3 years the child seeks pleasure from the anus, for example, withholding and expelling feces. The period in a child's psychosexual development during which the child's main concerns are with the processes of elimination, the anal stage, generally the second and third years of life, is held to be significant for the child's later development because the acquisition of bowel control is presumed to be connected to other forms of self-control such as cleanliness and orderliness. Third stage, phallic, three to six years the child seeks pleasure from the penis or clitoris, for example, masturbation, the phallic stage is the third stage of psychosexual development, spanning the ages of three to six years, wherein the infant's libido, desire, centers upon their genitalia as the erogenous zone. The child becomes aware of anatomical sex differences, which sets in motion the conflict between erotic attraction, resentment, rivalry, jealousy and fear which Freud called the Oedipus complex, in boys, and the Electra complex, in girls, Oedipus complex in the young boy, the Oedipus complex or more correctly, conflict, arises because the boy develops sexual, pleasurable, desires for his mother, Electra complex the girl resolves this by repressing her desire for her father and substituting the wish for a penis with the wish for a baby. The girl blames her mother for her castrated state, and this creates great tension. This is resolved through the process of identification, which involves the child adopting the characteristics of the same sex parent. Fourth stage, latent, six years to puberty the child has little or no sexual motivation. The latency stage is the fourth stage of psychosexual development, spanning the period of six years to puberty. During this stage the libido is dormant and no further psychosexual development takes place. Latent means hidden. Freud thought that most sexual impulses are repressed during the latent stage, and sexual energy can be sublimated towards schoolwork, hobbies, 
and friendships. Much of the child's energy is channeled into developing new skills and acquiring new knowledge, and play becomes largely confined to other children of the same gender. Fifth stage, genital, puberty to adult The child seeks pleasure from the penis or vagina, for example, sexual intercourse. McLeod, 2013. Freud hypothesized that an individual must successfully complete each stage to become a psychologically healthy adult with a fully formed ego and superego, otherwise, individuals may become stuck or fixated in a particular stage, causing emotional and behavioral problems in adulthood. McLeod, 2013. The genital stage is the last stage of Freud's psychosexual theory of personality development, and begins in puberty. It is a time of adolescent sexual experimentation, the successful resolution of which is settling down in a loving one-to-one -one relationship with another person in our twenties. Sexual instinct is directed to heterosexual pleasure, rather than self-pleasure like during the phallic stage. For Freud, the proper outlet of the sexual instinct in adults was through heterosexual intercourse. Fixation and conflict may prevent this with the consequence that sexual perversions may develop, for example. Fixation at the oral stage may result in a person gaining sexual pleasure primarily from kissing and oral sex, rather than sexual intercourse. The interpretation of dreams Another well-known concept from Freud was his belief in the significance of dreams. He believed that analyzing one's dreams can give valuable insight into the unconscious mind. In 1900, Freud published the book The Interpretation of Dreams in which he outlined his hypothesis that the primary purpose of dreams was to provide individuals with wish fulfillment, allowing them to work through some of their repressed issues in a situation free from consciousness and the constraints of reality. Sigmund Freud Biography, N.D. Next is number, 3. Robert Ezra Park, 1864-1944. Park is a strong advocate of the scientific method in explaining criminality but he is a sociologist. He advocated the human ecology theory. Human ecology is the study of the interrelationship of people and their environment. This theory maintains that crime is a function of social change that occurs along with environmental change. It also maintains that the isolation, segregation, competition, conflict, social contract, Interaction and social hierarchy of people are the major influences of criminal behavior and crimes. Middle 20th century. In this period several personalities theorize that crime is a result of a mixture of the biological and social causes. Namely, 1. Ernest Kretschmer 1888-1964, the idea of somatotyping was originated from the work of a German psychiatrist, Ernest Kretschmer who distinguished three principal types of physique as a asthenic, lean, slightly built, narrow shoulders b athletic, medium to tall, strong, muscular, coarse bones c pinnock, medium height, rounded figure, massive neck, broad face. Kretschmer related these body physique to various psychotic behavioral patterns, pinnock to manic depression, Asthenics and athletics to schizophrenia. 2. William H. Sheldon, 1898-1977. Sheldon is an influence of the somatotype school of criminology, which related body built to behavior. He became popular of his own somatotyping theory. His key ideas are concentrated on the principle of survival of the fittest as a behavioral science. He combines the biological and psychological explanation to understand deviant behavior. Sheldon's somatotyping theory maintains the belief of inheritance as the primary determinants of behavior and the physique is a reliable indicator of personality. Classification of body physique by Sheldon A. Endomorphy, a type with relatively predominance of soft, roundness throughout the regions of the body. They have low specific gravity. Persons with typically relaxed and comfortable disposition. B. Mesomorphy, athletic type. Predominance of muscle, bone and connective tissue, normally heavy, hard and firm, sting and tough. They are the people who are routinely active and aggressive, and they are the most likely to commit crimes. C. Ectomorphy, thin physique, flat chest, delicacy through the body, slender, poorly muscled. They tend to look more fatigued and withdrawn. 3. Edwin Sutherland, 1883-1950 
Sutherland has been referred to as the most important criminologist of the 20th century because his explanation about crime and criminal behavior can be seen as a corrected extension of social perspective. For this reason, he was considered as the dean of modern criminology. He said that crime is learned and not inherited. He advocated the debt, differential association theory, which maintained that the society is composed of different group organization. The societies consist of a group of people having criminalistic tradition and anti-criminalistic tradition, and that criminal behavior is learned and not inherited. It is learned through the process of communication, and learning process includes technique of committing the crime, motive and attitude. The differential association theory is the most talked about of the learning theories of deviance. This theory focuses on how individuals learn to become criminals but does not concern itself with why they become criminals. Learning theory is closely related to the interactionist perspective, however, it is not considered so because interactionism focuses on the construction of boundaries in society and person's perceptions of them. Learning theory is considered a positivist approach because it focuses on specific acts, opposed to the more subjective position of social impressions on one's identity, and how those may compel to act. They learn how to commit criminal acts, they learn motives, drives, rationalizations, and attitudes. It grows socially easier for the individuals to commit a crime. Their inspiration is the processes of cultural transmission and construction. Sutherland had developed the idea of the self as a social construct, as when a person's self-image is continuously being reconstructed especially when interacting with other people. Sutherland's theory of differential association The principles of Sutherland's theory of differential association have nine key areas to explain behavior. 1. Criminal behavior is learned from other individuals. 2. Criminal behavior is learned in interaction with other persons in a process of communication. 3. The principal part of the learning of criminal behavior occurs within intimate personal groups. 4. When criminal behavior is learned, the learning includes a. Techniques of committing the crime, which are sometimes very complicated, sometimes simple. b. The specific direction of motives, drives, rationalizations, and attitudes. 5. The specific direction of motives and drives is learned from definitions of the legal codes as favorable or unfavorable. 6. A person becomes delinquent because of an excess of definitions favorable to violation of law over definitions unfavorable to violation of the law. 7. Differential associations may vary in frequency, duration, priority, and intensity. 8. The process of learning criminal behavior by association with criminal and anti-criminal patterns involves all of the mechanisms that are involved in any other learning. 9. While criminal behavior is an expression of general needs and values, it is not explained by those needs and values, since non-criminal behavior is an expression of the same needs and values. 4. Walter Reckless, 1899-1988, The Containment Theory This theory assumes that for every individual there exists a containing external structure and a protective internal structure, both of which provide defense protection or insulation against crime or delinquency. According to Reckless, the outer structure of an individual are the external pressures such as poverty, unemployment and blocked opportunities while the inner containment refers to the person's self-control ensured by strong ego, good self-image, well-developed conscience, high frustration tolerance and high sense of responsibility. Adler, 1995. In the 1960s he generalized this finding into a containment theory, which argued that there are inner and outer forces of containment that restrain a person from committing a crime, the inner forces stem from moral and religious beliefs as well as from a personal sense of right and wrong, the outer forces come from family members, teachers, or others who influence the individual to some degree. The effectiveness of containment forces can be influenced by external factors such as effective supervision and internal factors such as a good self-concept. Reckless's work also focused on push-pull forces as explanations of deviant behavior, including internal pushes such as discontent and rebellion and external pulls such as delinquent acquaintances. 5. Karl Marx, Frederick Engel, Willem Bonger, 1818-1940, 
They are the proponents of the social class conflict and capitalism theory. Marx and Engel claim that the ruling class in a capitalist society is responsible for the creation of criminal law and their ideological bases in the interpretation and enforcement of the laws, all are reflected in the ruling class. Thus crime and delinquency are reflected on the demoralized surplus of population, which is made up of the underprivileged usually the unemployed and underemployed. Willem Bonger, a Marxist socialist, on the other hand, placed more emphasis on working about crimes of economic gain. He believes that profit motive of capitalism generates an egoistic personality. Hence, crime is an inevitable outcome. Late 20th century, the contemporary pioneers. 1. Robert King Merton, 1910. Robert Merton is the premier sociologist of the modern days who, after Durkheim, also related the crime problem to enemy. He advocated the strain theory, which maintains that the failure of man to achieve a higher status of life caused them to commit crimes in order for that status, goal to be attained. He argued that crime is a means to achieve goals and the social structure is the root of the crime problem. Merton's explanation to criminal behavior assumes that people are law-abiding but when under great pressure will result to crime. The theory states that society puts pressure on individuals to achieve socially accepted goals, such as the American dream, though they lack the means. This leads to strain which may lead individuals to commit crimes like selling drugs or becoming involved in prostitution as a means to gain financial security. 1. Strain could be structural. This refers to the processes at the societal level which filter down and affect how the individual perceives his or her needs, that is if particular social structures are inherently inadequate or there is inadequate regulation. This may change the individual's perceptions as to means and opportunities, or individual. This refers to the frictions and pains experienced by an individual as he or she looks for ways to satisfy his or her needs, that is if the goals of a society become significant to an individual, actually achieving them may become more important than the means adopted. In addition, he saw how minority groups had a harder time acquiring a good education, and if they could, they had a harder time acquiring a respectable living. Yet the same high standard for success is enforced on everyone regardless if they had a means to satisfy such standards. These contradictions led him to develop the strain theory because of society's higher reverence towards achieving success. 3. Individuals are forced to work within the system or become members of deviant subcultures in order to achieve socially prescribed goals. Merton's belief became the theory known as strain theory. Merton added that when individuals are faced with a gap between their goals, usually monetary, and their current status, strain occurs. When individuals are faced with strain, Merton outlined five different ways that they respond. 1. Conformity pursuing cultural goals through socially approved means, most common, hopeful poor, innovation, accepting society's goals but designing their own means for achieving them, often using socially unapproved or unconventional means to obtain culturally approved goals, example, dealing drugs or stealing to achieve financial security, surviving poor, ritualism, using the same socially approved means to achieve less elusive goals, more modest and humble passive poor, retreatism, to reject both the cultural goals and the means to obtain it, then find a way to escape it, retreating poor, rebellion, to reject cultural goals and the prescribed means to achieve them, then work towards replacing both of them, resisting poor. 2. Albert Cohen, 1918, he advocated the subculture theory of delinquency. Cohen claims that the lower class cannot socialize effectively as the middle class in what is considered appropriate middle class behavior. Thus, the lower class gathered together share their common problems, forming a subculture that rejects middle class values. Cohen called this process as reaction formation. Much of this behavior comes to be called delinquent behavior. The subculture is called a gang and the kids are called delinquents. He put emphasis on the explanation of prevalence origins, process and purposes as factors to crime. 3. Gresham Sykes, 1922, he advocated the neutralization theory. It maintains that an individual will obey or disobey societal rules depending upon his or her ability to rationalize whether he is protected from hurt or destruction. 
people become law-abiding if they feel they are benefited by it and they violate it if these laws are not favorable to them. 4. Lloyd Olin, 1928, he advocated the dot, differential opportunity theory. This theory explains that society leaves the lower class to want things and society does things to people. He claimed that there is differential opportunity, or access, to success goals by both legitimate and illegitimate means depending on the specific location of the individual within the social structure. Thus, lower class groups are provided with greater opportunities for the acquisition of deviant tax. 5. Frank Tenenbaum, Edwin Lemert, Howard Becker. 1822 to 1982, they are the advocates of the labeling theory, the theory that explains about social reaction to behavior. The theory maintains that the original cause of crime cannot be known, no behavior is intrinsically criminal, behavior becomes criminal if it is labeled as such. 6. Earl Richard Quinney, 1934, he was a Marxist criminologist who advocated the instrumentalist theory of capitalist rule. He argued that the state exists as a device for controlling the exploited class, the class that labors for the benefit of the ruling class. He claims that upper classes create laws that protect their interest and at the same time the unwanted behavior of all other members of society. Quinney's major contribution is that he proposed the shift in focus from looking for the causes of crime from the individual to the examination of the criminal justice system for clues. Other theorists. 1. Charles Darwin's theory, 1809-1882, in the theory of evolution, he claimed that humans, like other animals, are parasite. Man is an organism having an animalistic behavior that is dependent on other animals for survival. Thus, man kills and steals to live. 2. Charles Goring's theory, 1870-1919, the medical officer in prison in England who accepted the Lombroso's challenge that body physique is a determinant to behavior. Goring concluded that there is no such thing a physical chemical type. He contradicted the Lombroso's idea that criminality can be seen through features alone. Nevertheless, Goring accepted that criminals are physically inferior to normal individuals in the sense that criminals tend to be shorter and have less weight than non-criminals. 3. Ernest Houdin's Theory 1887-1954, an anthropologist who re-examined the work of Goring and found out that all thin men tend to commit forgery and fraud, undersized men are thieves and burglars, short heavy person commit assault, rape and other sex crimes, whereas mediocre, average, physique flounder around among other crimes. He also contended that criminals are originally inferior, and that crime is the result of the impact of environment. 4. Adolf Tillet, 1796-1874. Tillet was a Belgian statistician who pioneered cartography and the cartographical school of criminology that placed emphasis on social statistics. He discovered, basing on his research, that crimes against persons increased during summer and crimes against property tends to increase during winter. That ends our discussion on the theories of crimes. Thank you for watching. For your comments and suggestion type it in the comment box below. Enjoy watching and never stop learning.